tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Why a BC United MLA is crossing the floor to join the Conservatives. I was finding it uh, in incredibly difficult or increasingly difficult would be a better way of putting that to be able to speak up on behalf of those who actually elected me. We remain focused on policy and, and the politics. He can make his own decisions around that. What his former party is saying about the internal issues that had with Bruce Banman. Plus, the staggering number of homes needed in order for housing to be affordable to most Canadians with Canada nowhere close to the target. And it's a common ingredient found in cold and flu meds. And the U.S. is deciding whether to ban it. But should Canada follow suit? This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Anita Bath. The BC Conservative Party now has official party status in the BC legislature after a BC United MLA crossed party lines today. Abbotsford South MLA Bruce Banman's former party says there were internal management issues with him. But as Mayor Baines reports, political experts say the change could split votes, leading to an easier victory for the NDP in the next election. The B.C. Conservatives announced this morning that Abbotsford South MLA Bruce Banman is joining the party. He says he wants a change to speak his mind freely, and he did just that on CBC's B.C. Today. I just think that when it comes to something as important as democracy, that we need to have the ability to have the freedom of speech. The former mayor of Abbotsford joins the leader of the party, John Rustad. Rustad was kicked out of the BC United caucus after he questioned the role of carbon dioxide in climate change. I, I need more information on that particular issue, and I believe that healthy debate is, is good. Still, with two elected MLAs, the party gains official status, the same as the Greens. A poll conducted by Main Street Research shows the NDP in the lead, the BC Conservatives in second, BC United lagging in third, with the Greens in fourth position. The sample size was small, 601 people with a 4% margin of error, but still, the poll has raised eyebrows. With official party status, the B.C. Conservatives can get access to more funding from the legislature, an opportunity to ask questions of the government, and also positions on committees. And we will work together for a greater future in the province of British Columbia. B.C. United leader Kevin Falcon says Bandman's departure was not entirely unexpected yeah. and says it betrays Bandman's Abbotsford constituents. Bruce was a, a bit of a management challenge for us on an ongoing basis. John Rustad can enjoy that as they go forward together. Name recognition is becoming an issue. His party recently changed its name from BC Liberals to BC United. Falcon says people could be confusing the BC Conservatives with the federal Conservatives. When they're thinking Conservative, they're not thinking BC Conservative, they're thinking the federal Conservatives, obviously. Political experts say this could indicate a split in the right of centre vote, paving an easier path for the NDP in the next provincial election. The NDP has that much more cushion uh, to, to govern from, from the centre and, and uh, without a particular threat from, from the Green Party, it seems, they, they are uh, set to uh, perhaps cruise to victory. BC United says it doesn't expect more MLA defections, but that remains to be seen. Mira Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. Concern tonight from some in Surrey who say delaying the new hospital there is a disheartening move because Surrey's population is growing so fast. The hospital opening date has been pushed back three years to 2030. I think there is a, a major leadership opportunity for the BC government uh, to really revitalize the plan for that second hospital, uh, to also add a critical care tower to our existing hospital, to increase the number of beds to keep pace uh, with the population growth, and also to uh, prepare for the upcoming population growth. We need to stop being reactive. We need to be proactive 
proactive as it relates to health care investments. Uh, this government has invested in Surrey. Uh, they have been proactive, but now is the time to be really revolutionary in terms of change around health care investments. And I would also say other infrastructure investments uh, for Surrey and the South Fraser region. All week, we've been breaking down the issue of school portables in British Columbia, including which areas of the province have more of them and who is to blame politically. But what do the people who actually use the portables think about them? Well, a few months ago, Justin McElroy got down to their level to investigate. When we hear about school portables, it's mostly from politicians or parents, and usually in a negative light. But if portables are so bad, why are they bad? And what can be done about it? we put together an exclusive focus group to discuss this situation. All right, show of hands. Who here has spent a year in a portable? All right, another show of hands. Who here liked being in a portable compared to a regular classroom? Why is it worse? There's no bathroom in portables, so you have to go to the bathroom in the school, so you have to walk to the school. And in the winter, um... You have, when you have to go to the washroom, you have to put all your snow gear on and walk in the snow, So and then you get soaked. There's no sink to wash your hands, and you have to use sanitizer. Sometimes when you have cuts, like it really hurts. What else? This is the airing of grievances. When it stinks, it really stinks. It was a lot more challenging to get into the portable with crutches, and I had to ask my friends for most of the help. We don't really have AC, so in the summer, or like when it got hot, it was like super hot. It was like, it got like hot and stuff in there. So like what do your teachers do when it gets way too cold or way too hot? They basically just keep doing whatever they were doing before. When it's too warm, um, sometimes the teachers open the windows. D does that work? Kinda, but it's too loud outside. If you could make your portables, like what's actually inside of them better at all, you're given like an unlimited budget, what happens? Probably put AC in it for the summer. I think they should add a ramp. I feel like for, for wheelchairs. And it would be so easy, right? Yeah. Be a lot better. A washroom and a sink? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be nice. It's just that easy. You gotta get to Victoria, figure it out. Is there anything that's good in terms of how they're designed or how they're different from a regular classroom? Uh, I kinda liked it. Yeah? How come? It's right outside and when the bell rings, I could just go right home. Yeah. Convenient. I'm just very tired of them because I've been in them for two years now and it just would feel better if I was in the school. It may be what these kids want, but kids often don't get what they want and that hasn't changed in Surrey Portables for a long time. It's so bad about 5,000 kids will be going to school in portable classrooms this year. One school now has a dozen portables, up from seven it had last year, and the students don't like it. If you want to go to a washroom, they're only in the school. You have to go run through the rain. In the summer, it's too hot, and in the winter, it gets too cold, and, and the furnaces always break down. Yeah. That's our Justin McElroy reporting tonight. Well, a Vancouver apartment building that has been vacant and boarded up since a fire broke out more than a month ago caught fire yet again today. This time, Vancouver Fire Services says unlawful entry could be part of the cause. These buildings are vacant and they're fenced for a reason, so people do not enter, but people seem to find a way to get inside and squat in them. 30 firefighters responded to East 10th and Guelph Street at 8.30 this morning. The building was boarded up and fenced because of the previous fire, which led to the di displacement of 70 tenants. Upon investigating, it turns out people were squatting in the building. The fire was on the main floor. There are no reported injuries and the damage was residual. The occupants were told to leave the building. Well, Canada's federal housing agency is once again sounding the alarm about the shortage of homes in this country. A new report released today updates the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation's supply gaps estimate. CMHC says Canada will need to build an additional 3.5 million housing units by 2030 in order to return home prices to affordable levels. Those additional units are on top of the 18 million that are already expected to be built during that time. CMHC uses home prices from 2004 as its baseline for affordability. At that time, an average household would have to devote 40 to 45% of its disposable income 
for the purchase of a home. Now it takes more than 60 percent on average. Now, that report comes as the federal government announced plans to try to alleviate that shortage by fast-tracking the construction of new homes. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau made the announcement during the federal Liberal caucus in London, Ontario. As Ashley Burke reports, it's all happening at a time when the party is facing its worst polling numbers since forming government in 2015. A show of anger outside Liberal caucus where the doors are locked. A day after a small group of demonstrators greeted MPs at their hotel with profanities and demands. The Prime Minister says he's not going anywhere as he tries to show he's listening to people's frustration. Canadians are struggling right across the country uh, and that's why we're responding. Trudeau and his new housing minister announcing London as their first partner for an already announced fund to help the city fast track building more than 2,000 homes and they put a call out to other cities to apply. A new standard has been set and we have new expectations. We want you to build houses near transit. We want you to build houses near campuses. $74 million for London, a city the mayor says is emblematic of Canada's housing crisis. Rent and house prices more than doubling in just the past few years. Before um, the pandemic, we had about 300 um, individuals homeless or unsheltered on our streets. Today, we have about 2,000. This latest announcement comes after MPs heard concerns knocking on doors this summer. Nobody is saying that these are wonderful times at all. But the bottom line is, are we working? Absolutely. Are we listening? Absolutely. Caucus is meeting amid the Liberals sinking in the polls to lows the Trudeau government hasn't seen before. Is confidence in the Prime Minister shaken right now? Not for me. Listen, this Prime Minister has led us through the most challenging times. I don't see that, we, that we're facing an election tomorrow. Um, so I think we need to just focus. This, this is a time really for frank discussions. This London area MP wants a stronger response to Conservative leader Pierre Polyev, including attack ads. I think people need to see who he's been for the last uh, 19 years that he's been an MP. And uh, what's actually, uh, what has he done? Immigration Minister Mark Miller says there's tension within the party over whether or not to fight fire with fire after promising electors that they wouldn't engage in that kind of behavior. Talks wrap up here tomorrow. Ashley Burke, CBC News, London, Ontario. A new inpatient tower and an integrated cancer center is in the works for Burnaby Hospital. This will cost around $1.7 billion. All of these projects have significant cost increases, but we need to build it. People in Burnaby and in this community needed a new hospital for a generation. And these projects were delayed and delayed and delayed while we are proceeding. These expanded health services are part of the phase two redevelopment of the hospital. The inpatient tower will be 12 stories and will include 160 rooms. It will also include a new BC Cancer Centre plus general medicine, medical oncology, cardiac telemetry and intensive care. Construction is already underway on the hospital expansion. This part is set to start in 2025. A report released today by the B.C. General Employees Union is calling the province to amend the Residential Tenancy Act as part of a solution to B.C.'s housing crisis. This policy would immediately and universally moderate the rate of rent increases across the province and send a strong message to the people in British Columbia that this government is ready to take bold steps to stop the housing crisis from escalating further. The union was joined by organizations from across the province at the B.C. legislature to rally in support of vacancy control, which means the rental price is tied to the unit as opposed to the tenancy agreement. The B.C. GEU's report found the lack of vacancy control acts as a loophole for B.C.'s rent control laws, allowing rents to rise 10 to 23 percent year after year since 2019. Well, BC's worst summer for forest fires continues, with 200 more wildfires burning in the province now than there were this time last year. The climate crisis isn't just knocking on our door. It has stormed into our house, and as we have seen, the consequences are severe. The month of August set records for wind intensity and extreme drought, and 80% of the province remains at drought level 4 or 5. The fall will bring cooler temperatures and longer nights. It will also mean less lightning storms, which started 72% of fires this year.
Meanwhile, the Squamish Lillooet Regional District now confirms the Downton Lake wildfire destroyed dozens of structures in and around Gun Lake, north of Pemberton. The district says structures on 43 properties were wiped out, while 11 properties experienced partial structure loss. The evacuation order for the fire has now been downgraded to an alert, but the district is asking people to be cautious as they return and wants non-residents to stay away for the moment. Time now to check in with Darius Madavi, and you're looking at the fire situation closely. Where are we at at the moment? Well, it does seem like we've improved a little bit since Monday when we look at the fire danger map, in part because we did see a little bit of precipitation in some parts of the province. But I want to emphasize that this is mostly, the fire danger map is mostly useful for looking at where we might see new fires. It doesn't necessarily capture fire activity. So, for instance, up north today, we had some very high winds. Around Fort St. John, they were 40 kilometers per hour sustained, gusting to 60 kilometers per hour, which is uh, can, can cause some really severe fire activity, which isn't necessarily captured by the fire danger maps. This is a great reference point, but sometimes there is some nuance that you lose, so it's important to recognize that it's not necessarily the be-all and end-all. With that being said, we are seeing some dry conditions building across the province. That rain that we saw pass through isn't going to last, and we are seeing temperatures climb as another ridge of high pressure sets up. So temperatures come up a little bit tomorrow, especially in the southern interior. By the time we hit Friday, they have come up even more to close to 30 in places like Kamloops, above 30 in Lytton, and up in the north as well, where we are seeing that uh, more severe fire activity right now. By the time we get into the weekend, those temperatures come up uh, even further in some places, although we do see them come down a bit in others. In terms of rain, we are seeing a little bit more in the northwest today, but that's really, or, or heading into tomorrow, but that's really it across the province. Other than that, we are looking very dry and will until we get to at least this weekend when we might see some more rain pass through the province. But here in Vancouver tonight, we're looking at pretty seasonal temperatures sitting around the high teens. Tomorrow we'll get up to a similar temperature around 20 and the sun should be out shining once again. So it should be a pretty nice day tomorrow here in Vancouver and really across the south. All right. Thanks, Darius. Thank you. Well, over the course of six weeks this summer, CBC News deployed 50 sensors in the homes of people who didn't have access to adequate air conditioning. They look like this right here. Now, they did it in five different cities, including Vancouver. It's called the Urban Heat Project. Here's Tara Carmen to show you what the heat sensors measured and to break down the risk to millions of Canadians. The heat, the humidity is sweltering. Sweltering heat today. There's been a heat warning. Heat warning has been issued by the health unit. 50 sensors, five cities, so many stories from a long, hot summer. Windsor, Ontario. Greg Walton was feeling extreme heat from day one. I've taken a shower. I'm already starting to wet my shirt. I'm sweating profusely. Vancouver, July 18th. Samantha Johnson was dreading the summer ahead. If I do too much, I just perspire. Just It just pours off me because it's so warm. Everywhere we measured, there were similar stories. It was like almost um, 10 p.m. at night. The temperature at this time is 31. We found that temperatures inside were often far hotter than outside. Many people tend to think that if they remain indoors, they're safe. The problem is, is that indoor environments can get really hot. Ottawa professor Glenn Kenny studies the body's ability to lose heat. Looking at your data, there's no question that we have to be concerned. His research found people can generally handle indoor temperatures up to 26 Celsius. Your body has to try to lose more heat and your heart has to work harder to try and enhance that heat dissipation. So as you get above 26, it becomes more stressful on the body. CBC's analysis found half the homes in our test were above 26 degrees most of the time. Let's have a look at the data. You've been, yeah, above 28 degrees, um, even at nighttime. I sleep maybe two and a half hours, half an hour at a time. It's just too flippin' hot. 79-year-old Samantha Johnson feels she has nowhere to go day or night. I have heart failure, so as soon as I do any type of movement, the sweat just pours off of me. And so I could go to the library and I could stay there until six or seven, and then I could come back to this and not sleep all night, and then get up and go back to the library. Those politicians have got it all figured out, don't they? 
We also showed our findings to emergency doctor Aaron Orkin. The homes here are holding steady in the like 28, 29, uh, just shy of 30 degrees all the time uh, with almost no reprieve. Six weeks later, our sensors found that Greg Walton's apartment had the most stays over 26 degrees. Wow, like so it's like if it's 26 outside, it's like 33 degrees inside and I'm running fans and it's still that much hotter and it's still that much more humid and it's just like wow. But it has such a big difference on the quality of life and just the quality of experience that you're in when you're in your place. It's not safe and not, not good for your health to be in that kind of heat in an ongoing way period. That will be more dangerous for people who have other health conditions. But also it means that over time, people who are exposed to heat in an ongoing way will have shorter life expectancy. The heat became a life and death matter for 88-year-old Herman Gron, one of our participants who lived here in Surrey, BC. He was in and out of the hospital with breathing problems. Days after we last spoke to him, Herman passed away on August 14th of heart failure. That's a tragedy, and it's a tragedy at so many different levels. People home who are suffering from heat-related illness back into a home setting that simply cannot cool down. The idea that medications or other treatments will fix their health problems, their uh, respiratory disease, as this gentleman felt uh, and experienced, or their uh, there are other health problems that they'll be able to address those without getting the heat under control is equally absurd. Community advocate Marcia O'Brien says now that the facts are in, it's time to act. Wow. <laughs> is this for real? To actually see the proof of it. Speaking is one thing, but when you actually see the proof of it, it's alarming. Hopefully with this will come something amazing out of it. Okay, Tara is with me now to break down what comes next. So, Tara, there are climate adaptation plans in place by the federal government aiming to eliminate deaths from extreme heat by 2040. Is that at all realistic? Yeah, that's a great question. And my colleagues at What on Earth uh, actually put it to the federal environment minister, Stephen Guibault, and he said this is not something the federal government can do on its own because a lot of what needs to happen like setting up systems to identify and check in on vulnerable people or changing the building codes is the responsibility of provinces or cities so meeting that target depends how well everyone actually works together okay so 2040 though is 17 years away a lot of people need that help right now we've already seen you know several deaths from from heat in the last couple of years Yes, 17 years is a really long time. And Guibo says that target is 2040 because things like retrofitting all the buildings in Canada so that they don't overheat are expensive and take time. But it's clear that we need to protect those who are most vulnerable much sooner than that. And the federal plan notes extreme heat waves are the deadliest weather-related events in Canada. And we've just now heard that the BC government is proposing changes to the building code to require that new buildings have a room designed not to exceed 26 degrees. Tara Carmen has been leading the CBC Investigation Unit's heat project. Tara, thank you. Coming up, a major gap in housing across the country. We're live to talk solutions as Canada and BC fall behind in building. Thanks for watching our commercial free live stream tonight. A Charlottetown woman thought she had found her dream home when she signed a lease for an apartment and handed over the money. But the place wasn't a long term rental at all. And as Brittany Spencer tells us, the person who showed it to her didn't own it or even live there. This isn't exactly where Jory Livingston expected to be this September. She started her career as a paramedic earlier this year and thought she'd be settling into a new apartment. Instead, she's living with her parents. She thought she'd found a great place to live online, but it turned out to be a scam. I was really excited for the apartment. It was a nice spot, um, especially just for like a one bedroom. It had lots of space. I never would have imagined what was about to happen was about to happen. 
Livingston made an appointment to see a place, and when she got there, the person she'd been messaging with, the supposed landlord, showed her around. She says it was the perfect fit and signed a lease right away. She sent a damage deposit and the first month's rent, a total of $2,300. Her plan was to move in by the end of August. But as moving day approached, the person disappeared, and it turns out the unit wasn't his. It was a short-term rental. He was just staying for the night. He rented an Airbnb and showed a bunch of people uh, the spot for one evening. He just rented it for one evening, had a bunch of people in, got a bunch of people to sign a lease, send some money. It just, people are really desperate for housing right now and for rentals, so it's pretty evil to try to benefit off, off that. Charlottetown police say they're investigating five different reports of rental fraud at the same address, and there are two investigations happening in Moncton, too. RCMP are getting reports as well. They're investigating three cases of rental fraud in Stratford right now. No charges have been laid, but police say they believe they're all connected to the same person. Police say online rental scams are common, but these ones are unusual because people are meeting in person and seeing the apartments, and there are some things potential tenants can can do to avoid being taken in. You can always do a, a quick search online and, and uh, if this is a an online scam often there might be something connected to that address. If you're going to the apartment yourself uh, it's always good practice to speak with other tenants in the building. Uh, I can say with an investigation like this we'd be looking to identify the people involved so you know any photos or information about the the people who receive the monies uh, any information about their vehicle uh, is certainly a, a, a benefit for now livingston is hopeful the person is caught and she's grateful she has a place to stay but knows many others may not be as lucky Brittany spencer cbc news murray river Let's turn back to one of our top stories on the housing shortage across the country. The report from the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation says the country needs to build an additional 3.5 million housing units by 2030 to ease the affordability gap. That's on top of the 2.3 million we're on track to build now. The concern is we're falling far short. Craig Jones, Associate Director of the Housing Research Collaborative at UBC, joins me live now. Craig, that's the Canada-wide picture. I know you've pulled the numbers for BC's housing stock. Can you break that down for us? Yeah, absolutely. So this is really important work that CMHC is doing for the country in modeling the needed supply of units in order to uh, return to a level of affordability. And I 100% agree that we need to increase the supply of housing in Canada and in, and in, in BC. Um, however, uh, I think that reaching uh, affordability through increased supply is going to be really hard. So you mentioned that the 3.5 million units are in addition to the units that we're already projected to see. Um, so you know, we're looking at a, a need of over 5 million units across the country. And specifically in BC, the report would uh, projects that there'll be about 320,000 more units by 2030, which leaves a supply gap of 610,000 units. So uh, we would need, in order to reach the, the sort of level set by CMHC in this report, we would need 930,000 units in the eight years from 2022 to 2030. And I checked historic uh, historical CMHC data for housing completions and found that that is the same number of units that were built in the last 30 years. Wow. Um, so it's looking for an eight years supply that we took 30 years uh, to build. Um, so I would say that these are this, these are targets that are part of a model in order to arrive at a, a level of affordability. Um, but there are major challenges even in, you know, in, in reaching those targets. And I, sh I should note that housing completions in BC have been at um, uh, somewhat of a historic high since 2018. 
uh, with a number of new housing completions finally above those that we saw in the lead up to the great financial crisis. Okay, can you talk more about those challenges you say, though, in reaching that number that is a massive number, at, especially when you compare it to how much we've built in the last 30 years? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the report notes that their, uh, their estimates of demand, so this is a, an update for, from a report that was put out last year, that the estimate of housing demand will remain relatively is constant, remains relatively constant, but the projected supply gap increased because they now expect there to be fewer units to be built in BC than they did a year ago. And so in the last year, they note that uh, materials have gotten more expensive, labor is in short supply, supply um, and it's hard to get financing for construction, and that could possibly be because interest rates are, are higher. This all sounds pretty dire and, and hopeless, to be honest. Uh, are you hopeful at all that we are going to come close to reaching any sort of target, or is it just that we're going to keep being behind and behind and behind? So I would say that the numbers that CMHC are putting forward in, in these reports are um, part of a modeling process to say, you know, there's a series of assumptions that go into what it takes to get to affordability, and the model states where we need to be. Uh, I don't think it is particularly realistic that we will be at that point by by 2030, but it is still um, a valuable uh, guide or an assessment to see how much we would need in order to reach affordability by uh, supply. So um, in January of this year, Scotiabank put out a report in response to this uh, number of an additional 3.5 million units needed. And Scotiabank argued that reaching affordability through supply was, was unachievable. Uh, and so what they recommended is a doubling of Canada's housing stock of subsidized rental units. And that would doing that would bring Canada just in line with OECD and G7 averages, because right now Canada's stock of su subsidized rental units is among the lowest in the OECD at just 3.5% of housing. If we're talking about optimism, I've been in affordable housing research for over 10 years, um, and uh, there have been... There have actually been people saying that we have a housing problem for more than 20 years. Um, and I, I am hopeful that there are so many, all levels of government right now are really paying a lot of attention to the housing issue. Craig Jones is the Associate Director of the Housing Research Collaborative at UBC. Thanks so much for joining us live tonight. Thank you for having me. All right, as we told you at the top of the show, Abbotsford South MLA Bruce Bandman has left BC United for the Conservative Party of BC. Now, that gives the Conservatives official party status in the legislature. Bandman says he's switched parties because he found it increasingly difficult to speak up on behalf of his constituents. He spoke with the CBC's Michelle Elliott on BC Today this afternoon. Here's part of that interview. Your leader is now John Rustad, uh, who, wa who was ousted from BC United for his views on climate change and skepticism. As someone who was the critic on climate change, the former mayor of Abbotsford, which of course uh, suffered so much during the 2021 atmospheric rivers, how do you address concerns, uh, perhaps from your constituents or others, uh, now that you're aligning yourself with John Rustad? Well, John Rustad has a right to speak on behalf of what he thinks is important in his writing, which I said is different necessarily than what's in the Lower Mainland. I don't have to agree with everything everyone says, but what I do but have to do is... But this is your party, right? Do you not have to have I, aligned views? Again, again, I think that Canadians and British Columbians are looking for people that will speak up on behalf of the issues within their writing, which doesn't always focus eye to eye with every other writing across the province or across the country for that matter. So whether I agree with John is not the point. What's at heart of this issue here is the ability for those you elect to be able to speak up unfettered and, and, and campaign on behalf of the issues that they feel are important in their writings. And what I am sure that, you know, John and I have talked, we disagree on many, many things, but we agree on more than we disagree. And this, this attitude that's out there right now of, you have to agree with everything everyone says, like, you know, I, I've been married for a long time. My wife and I don't agree on everything each one of us says. And to think that we have to agree on everything, is just nonsensical. And this, we've got to get away from this in politics where all oh, that one little thing uh, brushes you as some kind of this or a denier or or, uh, or you're a hater or you're whatever. That, that, that is nothing but division politics. And it I don't think it suits overall what is important. What's important is finding consensus and being able to speak your mind as to what your constituents think is important in their writing. And they get a chance, as I said, 
to figure out whether or not I am speaking on their behalf. And, and, and okay. I took a look at what at my grandparents and I just had to start speaking my mind and, more on what my constituents say is important. And so what are what are your thoughts then on the role of carbon dioxide in climate change? Do you is that one of the issues you disagree with uh, uh, disagree on with John Rustad? Uh, I, I don't I, I I need more information on that particular issue and I believe that healthy debate is it, it is good um, I and again you come to a consensus after doing that and it and to, to focus it in onto one issue this is you know no no offense but that's what reporters do is they try to go down a rabbit hole that's not at the heart of the issue here the heart of the issue is open transparent debate on a host of issues and to have these Whipped party lines, I don't think is serving democracy well. But and don't that, you think for me, was the major reason. The terror after flooding in Libya grows by the day. As many as 20,000 are feared dead. The struggle to help and find survivors next. This is Jerome, one of the artists playing the Fringe Theater this year. He seems to be after something. Oh, I see. This is an audition for his act. Apparently, he's looking for a live worm. Only long, juicy ones need applied, and they must be able to sing and dance and follow instructions. Sit. Roll over. <laughs> the winning worm must work cheap and respond to audiences. The onlookers here don't seem to bother our successful candidate. We thought, well, what can a worm do is basically it. So we looked at them for a while and uh, tried to figure out a way to uh, animate it a little more and uh, came up with dancing with the worm and uh, having the worm speak through me, uh, not, not too cosmic, not channeling, but uh, the worm actually talks through me and is sort of Jerome's conscious and conscience in some ways. Jerome is really Jim Warren, a Toronto entertainer. The worm is part of his 50-minute stage routine about a man, a worm, and a baby. I can hardly wait to see how it turns out. The worms are, are very well taken care of for anybody that feels that uh, uh, they're not abused during the show. They are not, I've never lost the worm. Uh, they have all survived. And at the end of the run, uh, I free them into the garden to go back to their natural habitat. Bob Gillingham, CBC News, Vancouver.
Turning now to the catastrophic flooding in the Libyan port city of Derna. The reported number of dead is now more than 5,000, but there's worry that will reach 20,000. Margaret Evans shows us as responders tally the loss, some struggle to hold back tears. Colossal, the only word to describe the damage wrought by the floodwaters or the grief left in their wake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little mercy for the living left to collect their dead if they can find them. I already lost six people, says this man. We managed to take out three. We did not find the other three. These satellite images before and after the collapse of two dams near Derna show just how much of this city was ripped from muddy foundations. People swept away while sleeping, now given back by the sea. This is destiny, says this man. I lost my sister and her daughters. But for some, it was a tragedy that should have been avoided. We'd warned the authorities last week, no, for years, says this man, that the dam had cracks. A legacy first of the Muammar Gaddafi years, built in the 70s, and then of the power struggle that followed the dictator's fall. There's a country that is fractured between these rival systems, has made absolutely everything a nightmare to do. A UN-recognized government often accused of corruption in the West and a warlord backed by the likes of Russia in the East. A challenge for ordinary Libyans wanting to reach or send help to the flood zone. The bureaucratic red tape, the suffocating circumstances that are now there in eastern Libya are hampering the aid efforts. Help from outside is starting to arrive. But the need will only grow. Some 30,000 people displaced to be fed and housed. For now, the duty is still to the dead. The emotional toll of those doing the counting carried in the eyes of this doctor. Our families, our brothers, the figures are massive, he says. We belong to God, and to him we shall return. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Over to another region reeling from climate devastation. At least 2,900 people are confirmed dead and 5,500 injured after Morocco's devastating earthquake on Friday. The government has accepted help from some countries, but it's under growing pressure to accept more. The greatest destruction happened in remote rural villages of the Atlas Mountains. Relief camps are set up in accessible areas, but frustration is mounting with aid yet to reach some survivors. Morocco has limited aid into the country, and Canada is matching donations made to the Canadian Red Cross up to $3 million. Well, an Afghan family has been reunited in Victoria. Their journey started after a recent arrival asked for help bringing to Canada her three siblings who left behind in Pakistan with no support. The entire group is now safe in B.C. thanks to a Victoria resident who decided to sponsor them. So in Afghanistan, I was working with um, uh, international NGOs in, uh, uh, about girls' education and uh, women's rights. And after the Taliban took over the uh, control of Afghanistan, the situation got worse for us. We couldn't live there anymore. So um, I, my brother Rafi, and my sister and my brother-in-law, we left Afghanistan. Uh, we went to Pakistan. I was working with the media industry for a few years as a content writer, uh, but uh, then suddenly Taliban came and took over the country. We couldn't be able to make it anymore. And uh, now uh, we are waiting for my uh, uh, two other family members uh, to join us. And uh, finally, it's a happy ending for us. A year and a half ago, I wa wanted to pull a group together to sponsor two young women from Afghanistan. And it turned out that Tamina was one of those women. And she arrived uh, in December of last year and with a very heavy heart because she was happy to be in Canada but she wanted she left her siblings her brother sister and brother-in-law behind and at the time they had no hope of finding a safe country to live in 
and I promised Tamina when she arrived that I would do everything I could to get her siblings here. I'm so happy that uh, I um, uh, see my family there and I was uh, away from my rest of family from Kabul. Um, I'm so happy finally I, I reached to Canada. I'm so happy. A startling ruling that a popular allergy medicine doesn't work, why the FDA says it's useless, and what happens next for some popular brands. The province is investing $25 million for a new health hub that will serve the black communities of Brampton and Mississauga. Families need it, and members in the black community, black African Caribbean community, deserve to have equitable health care. MPP for Brampton Centre Charmaine Williams was joined by Ontario Health Minister Sylvia Jones at the announcement today in Brampton. She says it's been a long time coming. We're going to have a centre that is accessible, that is getting our community on the right track. Healthcare services provided at the hub will include maternal and infant health, chronic disease prevention and management, seniors' health and wellness, and mental health supports, with a special focus on prevalent diseases that disproportionately impact Black, African, and Caribbean communities, such as sickle cell disease. According to the Canadian Medical Association Journal, mortality from different cancers is higher in black patients than white patients, and overt and unconscious bias leads to patients' concerns not being taken seriously. The Black Health Hub will aim to right these health care wrongs. Thank you for listening to the voices from our communities, speaking of the dismissive care they receive, of denied treatments at various health care facilities, of the systemic discrimination and racism they encounter, Angela Carter is the executive director of Roots Community Services and as such has seen firsthand the consequences of black patients being ignored. The lack of understanding by professionals leading to feelings of inadequacy and a fractured mental health state. So I'm thrilled to see that these seeds are being planted, they're growing, they're blooming. Health is everything. Health is everything. The hub is expected to open sometime in 2024. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Hey, I'm Johanna Wagstaff. And hi there, I'm Rohith Joseph. And we're asking for 10 minutes of your day to go through the 10 things that the UN recommends we can all do when it comes to climate change. Please don't leave. No. And, and also the things <laughs> aren't new. We are just wired to not do them. We promise you to help you figure out your brains and you and your people can make better choices to combat climate change. 10 Minutes to Save the Planet is available now on CBC Listen and everywhere you get your podcasts.
time now for a look at the weather with Darius Madavi and you are tracking the drought situation. Is it getting any better? It doesn't seem that way. We did see a little bit of rain across the province earlier this week, but probably not enough to make much of a difference. Maybe we'll see a couple basins come down when the province releases the new update tomorrow, but I wouldn't expect too much. Uh, I know that just earlier this week, Vancouver saw record low inputs to the, uh, the water reservoir. So I don't see anything changing anytime soon. Earlier today in the fire update, the province did also warn we're expecting dry conditions ahead. So that means we may not see any reprieve coming in the near future. We have seen some dry conditions across the province today as well. We did see some rain yesterday uh, coming into some places and earlier this week, but we are drying up as a new high pressure system builds across the province. It's going to stretch all the way from the south coast up to Fort St. John. And so that's going to keep most of the province dry, even if tomorrow we do see a little bit more rain coming into the northwest. With that being said, we took a look at the rainfall accumulation earlier this hour, but let's take a look at a more long-term forecast. We do see some waves of precipitation moving through as early as Friday, coming to the central and north coast, and then up into the northwest. The rest of the province won't be seeing that rain until the weekend. We see another wave start to move in on Saturday, really hitting uh, the North Island by Sunday morning. And then that should move through other parts of the province by Sunday evening and into early Monday. Small chance that it makes it to Vancouver, but it seems likely that it would just miss us. It is quite far to say, uh, far out to say for any certainty, but I'd say a small chance of that rain, but it'll be overnight and you likely won't notice it by the time you wake up in the morning because it just, it won't be that much. But that could change. We can hope that it will change by the time we get to Sunday. So we'll see another update tomorrow. In terms of the smoke, we got a little bit of smoke happening for parts of the south coast, but our main problem areas, as usual, are up north central BC, and then we've got a few little pockets of local smoke in the southern interior. We're seeing some of these fires burn, but relatively speaking, it should be a fairly calm day in terms of smoke as we see that high pressure system build in, locking in place for some regions, but others will stay relatively clear. Tonight, we're seeing a pretty normal forecast. We've got pretty seasonal temperatures across the board. Tomorrow's forecast is pretty similar with lots of sun uh, in the forecast as we see that clearing through the end of the week. And for Vancouver, pretty much everything we've talked about, we've got that sun happening into the beginning of the weekend, small chance of rain Sunday night, and then we return to the sun for the beginning of next week. All right. Thanks, Darius. Thank you. Now, your favorite over-the-counter cold medicine may not be doing exactly what you think. Experts in the U.S. say a decongestant in many of those popular meds is effectively useless. Christine Birak now with the evidence and the advice here in this country. It's a common ingredient found in popular cough and cold meds like Sudafed PE and Tylenol Sinus. Phenylephrine is supposed to offer temporary relief from a blocked or stuffy nose, but advisors to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration say when taken as a tablet or liquid, it doesn't work. We made the recommendation to withdraw all currently available um, oral formulation of phenylephrine at 10 milligram. The FDA is still deciding whether to pull the products off pharmacy shelves. Health Canada says it's working on a statement, but doctors um, insist none of this is surprising. Uh, we've been saying this actually since 2011 in Canada. The Canadian Pediatric Society published this paper over a decade ago, advising cough and cold meds should not be given to children, saying the effectiveness has not been proven and they may be associated with medication errors. There's nothing that these drugs do that's special or magical. And I agree with the FDA that there's really no indication for them. You know, many of these drugs are not treating the underlying cause. They're just trying to help with the symptoms. To that end, nasal decongestant sprays can help. When the drug is sprayed directly inside the nose, it tightens the blood vessels so there's less blood flow, less fluid, and less mucus. Really, this just brings back the point that the first point of contact when you're standing in that aisle, confused, feeling like crap, feeling, like, feeling badly, is to talk to your pharmacist. Pharmacists note there were no safety issues raised around these cough and cold meds. And while some will end up in a pharmacy looking to relieve their stuffy nose, experts say staying hydrated, using a humidifier, even a teaspoon of honey can be cheap, easy alternatives. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto.
Coming up, the newest rescues from the Vancouver Aquarium. We meet some seals and their helping handlers next. Hi, I'm Amy Bell. Here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. With the changes to how Canada is able to access journalism online and on social media, we want to assure you that when you're looking for CBC News, you'll always be able to find us. Wherever you are in BC, local news, breaking stories, and the latest from around the world is at your fingertips any time of the day with the free CBC News app and online at cbcnews.ca. Download the CBC News app and stay connected wherever you are. Well, tonight, our last item is a cute one. We're showing you some of the recently rescued harbor seals at the Vancouver Aquarium's Marine Mammal Rescue Centre. Take a look. Well, we have our harbor seals. So typically this time of year, our facility is full of harbor seals and that is holding true. We've got 57 harbor seal pups, all young of the year, except for one um, that have brought in been brought to our facility for a large number of reasons, but uh, underlying is, is really just habitat destruction is the underlying cause of uh, rehab for these guys or need for rehab. Um, the animals uh, are usually here for about 10 to 12 weeks, maybe a little bit longer if they've got some more difficult underlying problems going on. 
the, the rehab, rehabilitation process is quite intensive. We have yeah. about 280 volunteers that do a lot of the work for us. It really is at the, at the beginning, typically, um, stabilizing animals, dealing with dehydration, malnutrition, wounds, secondary infections, eye lesions, that sort of thing. Stabilizing the animals, um, introducing them to a formula, getting them to weight, uh, gain weight. Normally their nursing period is only about four weeks with mom. It's a little bit longer here um, just because we're not mom. Um, but get them to a certain uh, weight, get them, uh, get them putting on weight, getting their teeth, and then switching them to fish, and then making sure they're eating fish on their own. Once they're doing that, we switch them into more of a sort of a group housing situation where the animals compete with other animals, kind of learn to fend for themselves a little bit, dive more, exercise more, and get that last bit of weight on them. And uh, then they're ready for release. Typically, animals are coming in here under birth weight, so probably about between five and seven kilograms of weight. We release them usually at 22 to 25 kilograms of weight. Well, we're super excited that the Vancouver Aquarium Marine Mammal Rescue Center has quite recently become its own nonprofit organization. And so there are a lot of things the community can do. Um, first of all, we are very much volunteer uh, run. We've got a very active volunteer program. And really, um, the aquarium, of course, is our number one um, supporter. Um, but our facility is getting a little bit old. We'd like to expand the program. We'd like to get a little bit better um, with some of the special species we deal with. So yeah, we're looking for help financially as well. They are adorable. Love ending our show with cute animals. Thank you so much for watching CBC Vancouver News tonight. We'll see you tomorrow.